Good girl. All righty. Praise the Lord. Good to be here this week. Um, uh, had to cancel Bible studies last this last week. Um, and uh, so I'm glad to be able to be here tonight and fellowship with you and, and uh, share in, in the Word tonight. And, uh, just give me a prayer. Uh, I just strengthen my inner man. So, praise the Lord. Any other prayer requests? Well, I got new, I got news. My dad is now back home, out of, out of, out of Cadillac. Good. good. So I still ask just to pray for his inner inner man. Good. You no, know, he does he does believe in his faith is in the death, burial, and resurrection. Good. Okay. Anybody else? We need prayer. Keep Sheila. Sheila in prayer. Okay. Thanks, welcome. Okay. She be prayer all the time. Yeah. And of Jan. Course. Yeah. Pray for the daycare. Mm -hmm. Jan Johnson. Okay. I don't remember all the names, but. Yeah, you know who she is. She was. Her. I want to make a special request for a close customer of mine. I'm going to name it Jerry Coiner. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Our gracious and wonderful Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together tonight. and. Lord, you see the variety of needs that are represented here and the situations and the concerns that are upon our heart. And so, Lord, we come to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, knowing that as you've begun a good work in each of us and you're going to see it to the completion thereof, Lord, we trust you and know that as we bring this prayer request to you, uh, your perfect will is going to be worked out in each and every life. And, Lord, we just thank you for the grace that we have to stand and the peace that passes all understanding that comes with that grace, enabling us to rest no matter what situations we face, no matter what comes our way. We know that we can be strengthened in our inner man as we look to the Word of God, knowing that through the Word, the Holy Spirit can encourage, can uplift, and can strengthen us. So now, Lord, as we turn to your Word tonight, I pray that as we continue our study on ambassadorship, Lord, that we would glean as the Holy Spirit would lead and guide and, and help us tonight to have understanding so that uh, as, as, we, as we see the knowledge and get the wisdom and we apply it to our lives, we will have the understanding of it and we can see the fruit of it being produced in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, as I promised. No, we think, I keep thinking of keep praying for Brian, but what about Christy? True. What she's going through. Yeah. 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 The whole family. The whole family. The whole family. So, so when you pray, remember that. Okay, so... Um, I've started the timer, so I keep to my word and, and keep Bible study uh, set. But uh, as, as I promised, each week as we start, uh, wh wherever we're at in the lesson, we're going to review the stuff on the first page. Because if we don't get it, that deep down in our soul and that doctrinal edifice is built up in our soul, the rest of this teaching will mean nothing because it is the springboard by which the Holy Spirit works to cause it to come to fruition in our lives. And I saved time by not writing it. I saved it this time and threatened anybody who went into my office who picked up an eraser, I was going to hurt them. Um, so, anyway, she knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, so, we're, we're, we're in the function of being an ambassador in, in our studies of moving forward in grace. Uh, and, and understanding what it means to live out the grace life and, and to flourish in that and the study of it. So we're in part three, lesson two, and we're going to pick up with what is truth this week. But as I promised, if you and I we need to have the doctrinal edifice built up in our soul for three reasons, so that we can discern uh, on our own, we can be led by the Holy Spirit, we can be taught by the Word of God. Somebody tell me the three references that you should know that apply to our study. One's coming from Romans and the other ones are coming from 2 Timothy. Come on. One well, Second 2 Timothy 2, 2, 15 and 16. Right. The other one is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Right. Good job, Jerry. And Romans 16, 20. Come on. 25 through 26. Yes! Good job, Jerry. <laughs> Good job, Jerry. Good job, bud. He's All right. He's no, he's not, Mom. He's right there. Are you reading it? I no, no. It's I'm right here, it. but I know it's right there. But I was, I, <laughs> no, I looked at his eyes. He wasn't reading. He was looking the other way. All right, so let's look at the Good verses. Job, Jerry. Romans 16, 25 and 26. 
next week there'll be a test. Okay? I'm going to oh, ask each game. of you. <laughs> Rattle them off. We're at school again, guys. Now it'll come to the point where it's like not just know the verse, but know the words. What are you looking at? You should already have this in your notes. I'm reading it. I know, but you already have your notes. From last she, time, you could just fill them in. She forgot to remember. Oh, I know, but she could fill them in from home. So, I mean, you, you're welcome to do that. I'm just saying. All right, so Romans 16, verse 25. Amen. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandments of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. You know, I was looking at this verse, and I wanted to give you another nugget to, to help you to remember how all this works together. Who remembers the three aspects of our salvation? Sanctification. Uh, first. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. Right, okay. Now, if you apply that to the, those verses, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, justification, because where do we get our justification? Is putting our faith where? The death, burial, and resurrection. All right, and then, uh, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Where do we get our doctrine for sanctification? The Word. Well, from that revelation. Yeah. Okay, and then, by, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandments of the everlasting God has been known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Remember, it's the rest of it all put together and how we function in the plan of God. Ultimately, we're going to be glorified, right? Mm -hmm. For what purpose? So we can rule and reign with Christ where? In, in heavenly places. places. So when you look at Romans 16, 25 and 26, you can see salvation laid out there in a nutshell. You have justification, sanctification, sanctification and glorification. glorification all laid out right there for you. Now, go to first, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 15. By the way, I wanted to share this with the rest of the group. I shared it with Ellen and, and, and uh, uh, Valerie. Valerie. Sorry, I was drawing a name blank there for a second. I um, hate that. Boy, I'm getting old. I turn 49 tomorrow. Um, it, I just lost where I was going with that. See? I just, You're telling them finished. about how many people. Oh, yeah. Uh, last... Not this lesson, because uh, last week's lesson hasn't been loaded up yet, but le uh, part three, lesson one, 1,145 people had viewed that video. And I was like, hot diggity dogs. And then you could see the other ones, they're going back and they're watching the other videos in the series, and it's all just, it's awesome. You I just thought you were humming at 800. Yeah, I thought it was, well, that's that's not, um, uh, that that's on Facebook for, how many, I thought it, that was cool too, 800 some people following us. And I looked, and, and because uh, one of the other ministers said, but you know, you know, that's how many likes you have, how many people are following you? And it's just right there. There may be a few that aren't following on a regular basis, but most of them have said it so that anytime I have a notification, it goes up and they watch it. So pretty cool. People around the world listening to me. <laughs> uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 is very intimidating at times. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto their own, excuse me, unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as does as a canker of whom, um, I'm going to figure out how to say these words, Hamanias and Philaetius, who according to the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past, already overflew the faith of so, and so you can see the results when, when we don't do what we've been commanded to do by the Apostle Paul in the dispensation of grace, and, and we allow ourselves to get wrapped up in things that are vain babblings, they're profane, they have nothing to do with godliness. Because remember, we've been looking at the verses um, in, in Titus uh, chapter 1-1 one, one, where it talks about, and the acknowledging of truth, which is after godliness, so when we follow that pattern of, of sound doctrine, sound words, sound truth that we should be applying today, we're going to see the fruits of godliness in our lives. If we don't, we're going to see the fruit of ungodliness. Now, three, uh, 316. 
All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You know, I remember learning that verse growing up my whole life, but nobody ever put 17 with it. They always said, you know, memorize 3.16 and uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. And, and you'll have it made. But there's a there's a colon after righteousness there that the Apostle Paul wants to finish his thought that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now remember, good works are what? A byproduct of our what? Sanctification. Yes. Edification. Edification, sanctification, justification. It's all byproducts. Remember, you can't put yourself into good works until you're what? Saved. Saved. You have to put your faith where it needs to be in the death, burial, and resurrection. I don't care how good they think it is, and, and so on and so forth. So, back to the notes on the first page. The result, the Spirit of God energizes that doctrine in your soul and gives you the discernment. So He energizes it, that doctrine in your soul, and gives you the discernment to know why God puts you in the body of Christ to do. And then you're motivated by the Word of God, so you can go out and do it. So as ambassadors, we have a job of guarding, protecting, proclaiming, and practicing. When we're guarding it, I know it goes along with protecting, but when we're guarding it, we have made a declaration to say, hey, I've accepted it, this is what it is, and when there's false doctrines come around, I'm going to know sound doctrine so that I can, in the right kind of, because we looked at this, there needs to be what kind of a spirit. Uh, it, it, and it's all right here in these verses. Go, go back to 2 Timothy 2.25, 2.24. Uh, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Remember, we talked about those. Those are folks that have put their faith where it needs to be, but they're living contrary to who they are as members of the church, the body of Christ. And, and, and they're denying their edification, ultimately, because they're not being edified by the proper doctrine. They may be edified by something, but it's not something that's going to produce the right fruit in their lives. The people that are trusting in their own works instead of trusting in and what Christ has already provided for them. Right. So we have a job to protect it, to proclaim it, and the big one is practice it. If, if we're going to protect it, we're going to proclaim it, but then we also have to practice. let it be lived. And here's the thing. Let it be lived out in our lives. People don't understand the powerful status, if you will, the, the powerful work of grace that it will, if you let it, it will work out in your life and your life will be transformed because of it. Not because you are doing it, but because the Holy Spirit in you is causing the change that needs to be placed. I mean, ultimately, you remember, you were dead and now you've been made alive. alive and you go from living in the Spirit to walking. walking. The Spirit. And yes, you have to apply the Word of God but the benefit of that is the Holy Spirit then takes it so that you can discern, be led, and be taught. And, and it causes that form of doctrine to be built up in your soul. It can be a wonderful we can't journey. Do it because His ways and our ways and thoughts are different. Exactly. All right, now, so we talked about the acknowledging of truth. And so we left off in our lesson under the subtitle, What is Truth? We're going to pick up with John 18, 38. John chapter 18, verse 38. And before I move on, any questions, of questions, not comments, questions about this? Is it clear to everybody? Because again, next week when I start, we're going to take five minutes and we're going to review because if, if, if the more you get it, the better it is. John 18, 38. John 18 verse 38. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find no fault 
at all. I find in him no fault at all. So here we have Pontius Pilate, you know, Christ is standing before him. He, you know, the chief priests have delivered him. They're trying to get a, 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 a command for execution. And Pilate's having a private conversation with him. And Pilate asks him, what is truth? Now, when we look at this whole book, is this whole book truth? Yes. Yes, it is. But how do we apply it? That's the question. How do we apply it? When Christ was walking the earth, he proclaimed truth, did he not? Yes, yes. he did. But specifically, who was it for? Nation of Israel. A nation of Israel. When we look at the but now, or excuse me, in times past in which Christ walked the earth, you had John the Baptist, you had Jesus, you had the 12 apostles up into the cross. Then you have Acts chapter uh, 1 and 2. You have the outpouring of the Spirit. Peter uh, standing up on the day of Pentecost to declare this God. Then you get over to Acts chapter uh, 7 where uh, Stephen is being stoned. You have this declaration of truth. Back here, there was a declaration of truth. truth. Here there's a declaration of truth. Here there's a declaration of truth. And here's a declaration of truth. But when you rightly divide the word of truth, as, we, as one of our central verses, 2 Timothy 2.15, we rightly divide, we understand that there's a separate in the truth being given here, being given here, and what will be given here. And if we keep them separate, it helps us to understand the truth that we should be walking in today and how we should be defending that truth, excuse me. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, so we have this body of truth that's been given to us. Now, is there uh, such, uh, if there's such, there's such a thing as absolute truth. Yes, the belief in absolutes is the um, only position that is not self-defeating. A self-defeating statement is one that does not meet its own standard. So, you and I have to come to the place, first of all, that this book is absolute truth. We accept it as absolute truth. That it's the Word of God given to us. We have to accept that. Now, it's all for us, but not necessarily to us. to us. And so that's where the, the, the thing that the church has missed in great regard is that they don't rightly divide the word of truth. And when they rightly divide the word of truth, when Jesus said, you know, Pilate asked him, what is truth? What Jesus declared in his day was truth. But does it mean we apply that truth to our lives? No. Is it negating who Jesus was and is? No. No. The message in which we teach and preach today comes from Christ himself, does it not? D -d Did we not read that in, in Romans chapter 16? Mm -hmm. It was given to the Apostle Paul by the revelation of, Jesus Christ. of the mystery of who? Jesus Christ. And we can look in Galatians where it says, I received it directly from the Lord. I lie not. So here we have the need to come to the place as apostles that, number one, this book is truth. truth. Number two, we as apostles in this day and hour have to know the circumference of this book, but we also have to know how to rightly divide this book. We know how we, we, we need to know how it plays all together, but we also need to know how it plays to, for us in this dispensation. You can't go back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and apply verses to your life. You can't fly with the folks on Facebook and just because they say pray this prayer seven times, I got one of those this week. I about died. And it's from a grace believer. What? S send, you know, send this forward and you're going to get blessed and blah, blah, blah. Well, and you're going to have prosperity, this, that, and the other. 
or you know pray you know if you believe God can heal you know pray this prayer and you're gonna get healed say amen bunk God is not healing in this day and hour there is no manifestation of healing. If Look, if there was and is, every time we pray for someone's healing, what should happen if we were operating the same way the apostles were operating that was supposed to be passed down to the Gentiles? How should we be operating? That every time we pray for healing, what should happen? Healing. Healing. You get prayerless, like you said. Was Jay Long, and how many of them have cancer on it? A lot of them. Some of them may be restored back to health through medication and through the wisdom of doctors, but a lot of them are going to what? Die. End up dying from cancer. And they're going to pray for healing Amen. to their last breath, and they're not going to get it. And you can't say they're going to get their ultimate healing when they die. That's not true either. The only thing that they're released out of is the, they're released out of this flesh. Their soul and spirit goes to Christ. I guarantee you, if someone dies of cancer, that cancer is still going to be on. That cancer is still going to be with them in the grave. The only way that's going to be changed is when at the, the rapture. at the rapture of the church, when this mortality will put on. It's part of the process, folks. It's part of the curse. We can pray for healing till we're blue in the face. God does not heal in the miraculous sense, as the same way when Jesus walked the earth. And when the twelve apostles were given the authority to cast out demons, to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, that ministry has been put on hold because the nation of Israel chose not to receive it, chose to reject the message, they fell and diminished in authority. Now the work has been passed on. And that yet we look at the apostle Paul, early on in his ministry, he had the capacity to do what? Heal, Heal the sick. They, they took what? Aprons and handkerchiefs off of him. And he, they, you know, they went forth and healed the sick. But there was a time and a place for that. The establishment of the church came that way. The authority of the Gentile church came that way. And most of it was done to provoke who to jealousy? During the Jesus. time of fall and diminishing. Once that period ended, and, and the institution of grace came into be. You see a decline. When you look at the book of Acts, you see this. The first half of the book of Acts is about the Apostle Peter and all the wonderful things he did, and all the miracles and so on and so forth. When the Apostle Paul picks up, he's going forth. By the end of it, he's not. And in fact, when you look at Corinthians, he prays three times that God would take the infirmity away from him. What does God say? My grace is sufficient for thee. He didn't get his healing. And there's friends that he left behind in the ministry because they got sick and couldn't travel anymore. Yet, at, at one point, the Apostle Paul had the ability to do what? Lay hands on the sick and watch them rise up. Take handkerchiefs and... So you see a... But see, people don't want to acknowledge those verses to see the transition that occurred. The book of Acts is not a history book. It is a transitional book. It is a time where it, there was a transition where it went from the nation of Israel... To the church, the body of Christ. And if you just look at the verses, it's there. And we have to come at go to John 17, 17. Just go over just a couple of verses. Here Jesus is praying for the twelve apostles. And this is truly the Lord's Prayer, not our Father, which art in heaven. That's not what we should be praying today. And we look at this, you know, and we come to the realization that Jesus was praying for his disciples and he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. truth. Again, Jesus is acknowledging what? The word. The word. That it's truth. And we need to accept it as what? Truth. Okay, despite the absurdity of believing that absolute truth does not exist, the culture has embraced the views that something is not true until they what? Choose to believe it. They believe that the act of believing makes things true. Go to Psalms 119. Psalms 119, verse 142.
There's one and two? No. Psalms 119 verses 142. 142. 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Again, when we examine what the Apostle Paul taught us about the law, go to Romans chapter 7. I know it's not in your notes, but I want you to see this. Because we're talking about the law there. And how it what? The, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is what? Truth. Now, go to Romans. Starting in chapter 6 and chapter 7, Paul begins to identify how his struggle with is with the law. Now, verse chap, chapter, chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be what? Destroyed, that henceforth we should not what? Serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also what? Live with, with him. him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, die, uh, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto who? God. God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul begins to teach us and edify us to the fact that, hey, because we're no longer under the law, and, 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 and to get the clarifying verses, you have to go back to verse 20 of chapter 5. It says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but, we, but where sin abound, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord. And he goes on, what shall, uh, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that the grace of God uh, may abound? Excuse me, that the grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So, in verse 20, what taught mankind about sin? What does what verse 20 say? For when you were the servants of sin, you were... Verse 20? 520? 520. 520. I'm so sorry. Well, just ignore what I just read. What, what, what entered in? The law. The law. Okay. Now, go over to chapter 7. Know ye not, brother? For I speak to them that what? Know the law. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he what? Live. Okay. And, and he goes on to examples. Now, go down to verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not what? Okay. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of consumptiousness, for without the law sin was dead. dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Okay, so, there's folks that want to tell you that you have to follow Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I tell you, no, and this is why. Jesus came to fulfill what? He tells you he became, came to fulfill what? The law. And everything he exonerated in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that he brought to light, brought to truth, reminded them of the truth, was concerning what? The law and the promises made to whom? The Israel. fathers, or the nation of Israel, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and how they would be beneficiaries of that. And so Romans chapter 6 begins to tell us, hey, we're free from that. We're no longer under the law. We're no longer under its dominion or power. But chapter 7 says, hey, now wait a second here. I got problems. And the reason why all of a sudden Paul had problems is because he put himself back under the what? Law. The law. And he's saying, hey, 
I don't need to be under this. But, but he wants to remind them. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had what? Said, thou shalt not covet. And so he's going, no, wait a second here. I've been free from this stuff. Now I feel the bondage again. Do you see what he's trying to teach us? That there was a time where the law had its prominence, but Christ came has taken and has fulfilled the law and the righteous requirement of the law so that now man can be totally free if he, what? What does he have to do to be totally free? Believe. So he has to make a choice to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. If he does that, he's been made free from the law of sin and death. True? True. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 24 of chapter 7. Actually, let's look at 26. Or 23, rather. For I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me... I'm in 623, 6, 623, sorry. 27, not Romans, or... Oh, excuse me. 723, forgive me. I was going to say, because I wasn't going to Sorry, forgive me. 723. <coughs> for I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members O wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body of death excuse me from the body of this death I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God but with the flesh the law of sin there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from what? The law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak to the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And, and you have to let the verses speak to you. Is Paul, what is Paul equaling here or examining the flesh to? What is he equaling it to in this whole study here, in these verses? What is he equaling the flesh to in these verses? What's he equaling it to? The law. No, the law. For what the, verse 3, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak to the flesh. Alright, so he's comparing the flesh and living in the spirit. Okay, if you're going to live in the flesh, you're going to follow the what? The, the law. The law. Yeah, you're going to follow the law. But if you're going to follow the spirit, you're going to follow after who? Christ. Christ. And him crucified. crucified, because that's your answer for this over here. Now, once you've come into recognition of that answer, you go from over here being dead in your trespasses and sin to being, a, to me being alive in Christ. And so Paul's saying here, here's an absolute truth that you need to get in your spirit. You and I are no longer bound by sin to the effect that it's going to separate us from the love of God. Excuse me. Christ took care of that so that would no longer be the issue that separated us from Christ. Are you and I going to still struggle with sin? Yes. yes. The only, and the only time sin is going to be completely dealt with is when this body of sin is changed. Okay? Paul's, what, what it, what it, what it, what, look it says, verse 23 again. Or actually verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inner man. But I see another law in my members. Now, you have to look at the verses and put it all in context of what Paul is talking about in verse 22. He's talking about verse 2 of chapter 8. The law of what? Life of Christ has made me free. Isn't that a law we're under now? Mm -hmm. That's a command. That's an ordinance of God. Well, wrong word. That's a command. That's a law established by God. That the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of what? Sin and death. Alright, so for I now go back to verse 22 with that insight of chapter 7. For I delight in the law of God after what? The, the inner, inner man. man. 
But I see another law in my what? Members. He's talking about his, his flesh. Warning against the law of his what? Mind. Mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my... Where is it at? Flesh. It's in his flesh. It's still going to be stuck in his flesh. But the law of the Spirit tells him in his inner man, he's been what? Set free from that. Do you see that? Isn't that powerful? And that's an absolute truth that we need to get down in our spirits because if we're going to teach grace in this day and hour, we need to teach the life that follows putting your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection. Because, yes, there's a lot of folks who have put their faith right here. They have put their faith in the death, burial, and resurrection. They understand the atoning work of Calvary. They cherish it. They love it. But they've been failed. The church has failed to teach them how to live out this life. What they've done is reared them back behind the cross on this side and put them back under the law and put them under bondage and fear only to do what Satan wants them to do is to keep them under control. One of the That's first the things that was said to me, yeah, the first, one of the very first things that was said to me by one of the brethren in the church, in the dome church, brother, you got to be, care uh, be careful about teaching this grace stuff. Because people get the idea that they can do whatever they want, they can live however they want, and do whatever they want, and still be saved. Well, that statement is true, but the, if, if, if he would move forward in the grace life, and walking in the grace life, he would understand, no, you can't live like you want if you're going to what? Be edified the way that you're supposed to be. Because what's going to happen? You're going to be stuck in chapter 7. You're going to have found the grace, you're going to have found the life, but you're going to walk a life that's going to be condemning, hard, difficult, not free, so that you can do what? Rest. Peace has come so that we can do what? Rest. Being faithful to the time. Okay, now, so do you see the absolute truth there? You also see that in, in my, my view, that shows the powerful walk through, through our edification, through the death, burial, and resurrection. Exactly. And, that, and that's what happens. It is a fruit or a byproduct of salvation that has been wrought in your life. That wonderful gift of grace that has been stowed upon each of us so that we can move forward in grace and how to live in grace. And see, you and I have to be, and it leads us to our next point, Apologetics. What is apologetics? And all apologetics is, is, is defending of what you believe. Now, go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Oh, pastor, you're going outside of our scope of study. Yeah, because this scope of study is what? This whole book. But we've also come to the place where we what? Rightly divide. I can go to 1 Peter and see what Peter's talking about, understanding and how it's going to be applied. I can look at this verse that I'm going to give you right now. Right. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that's asking you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Yeah. So apologetic derives from the Greek word apologia, which literally means to give a defense. And folks, this is what happens. As you allow that form of, of that doctrinal, of it, that, that form of sound doctrine to be built up in your souls, you'll come to the place where you'll have a defense. And that's why I always tell you, if, if, if you're not in the book, if you're not studying to show thyself approved unto God, you're going to be ashamed because you're going to look at the rest of the saints around you and you're going to go, why can they handle that situation and I can't? It's exactly what's going to happen. They're walking through this. Look, all of us walk through the same things. All of us are made of the same thing, created out of the same dirt, this earth. Okay? 
And we all have the same likes and passions and desires, the things that we want to do, the hopes and the dreams that, that we've been able to achieve or not achieve. We all struggle with all of those things. But if you don't put sound doctrine in you of how to live in this day and age, you're going to live a life of misery and struggle and fear and frustration. And confusion. Well, in confusion, because that's what all it was. Now, putting this back, if they applied, even starting with Moses, if the nation of Israel applied the law to their lives, they received the what? The benefits of that, right? Mm -hmm. When folks started believing in the message of Jesus Christ, the, the, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, be water baptized, make yourself ready, you know, uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. Rejoice. Okay. If they put themselves under that, they receive the benefits of doing so. You have the cross. The cross changes the picture for all of mankind. You come over here. If af after the, the resurrection of the Lord and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, and they started following Peter and the little flock, and, and they got saved under their ministry and followed the things that the, uh, the apostles were teaching, they received the benefits of doing so. Until when? They fell and diminished in power. All right? Now, over here, the same thing. Truth is going to be wrought. If they put themselves under the... the, the te leave it alone. Leave the teaching and ministry of the Holy Spirit in this time and in this age... They're going to benefit, right? Mm -hmm. We have the same thing in the age of grace. If we apply sound doctrine to our souls, we'll have the ability to defend for what we believe, you know, in, in, in what we believe. If we don't, then there's a problem. You're going to find yourself confused, listening to every voice, trying to satisfy the inner man. Okay, so, apologetics is the branch of Christian theology which answers the question, is Christianity rationally defensible? In other words, can Christianity be defended and therefore substantiated? I'm reading, it's in your notes. By using the same procedures, reasonable people everywhere use to determine the truthfulness of anything, whether it be scientific, historical, legal, philosophical, or religious. So Paul, the apologist. Okay. Of the seven times the Greek word apologia is used in the New Testament, six of the occurrences were either written by Paul or, or uh, recording as have been spoken by Paul. Go to Philippians chapter 1. Verses 7 and 17. Philippians chapter 1, verses 7 and 17. Philippians chapter 1. Oh, chapter 1. Yeah, Philippians chapter 1. Chapter 7. <laughs> verse 7 and 17. <clears throat> Even as it is meet for me to think of this, excuse me, of, of this of you all, because I've made you, I have made, I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. And you see, in defense and what confirmation. So Paul saying, hey, in the defense, in 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 that body of truth, there's a confirmation, a confirming. In the gospel. It's not confirmation like being slapped on the cheek and, you know, you've been confirmed. Okay? No. It's you accepting what the Apostle Paul has taught as truth. And here the Philippians, they've accepted it. So where does Paul hold them? His heart. In his heart. He's church. Now look at verse 17. 
but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. gospel. So he's saying, you know what? I love y'all, but I also have to defend the gospel here. There's a few things he wants to talk to them about. But he's saying, hey, knowing this, it's still out of love, but I've got to defend the gospel. Acts chapter 22, verse 1. Go ahead and get 22 in one hand and 25 in the other. And that's where we'll stop for today. Acts chapter 22 and verse 1. Here the Apostle Paul is standing up. He's going to uh, give an offense. He's going to give an account. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I may... Make known unto you. Go over to chapter 25, verse 16. Here, Paul's testifying and sharing uh, before the king, and he's saying to King Agrippa, Hey, this is what occurred. I'm, I'm giving defense. I'm, I'm, I'm making an open defense of what occurred to me. It says, but, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, and to make thee a minister and witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and those things in which I will appear unto thee. Did I go too far? Yeah, you're somewhere. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm it's a good verse. It works. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Go back to... Acts chapter 25, verse 16, not 26, 17. <laughs> oh, I'm so good at that. 25, 16. To whom I answered, It is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which I accuse have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself according to the crime laid against them. Therefore, when they were come hither without any delay, on morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and command the man to be brought forth. So here, there's a defense given for the Apostle Paul. Now go over to Acts 26 and verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, and to make thee a minister, a witness, both to these things which thou hast seen, and those things which... I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom I will send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Wherefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, and so on. So he, he lays it out and he gives a defense for what he believes. As it states in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, we need to come to the place to give a reason for our hope. With, let me say it this way. I think a lot of times, in fact I don't think I know, a lot of times folks will get fearful about defending their faith, afraid that they're going to say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. This is why over the years I've encouraged you to sit down and maybe in, in, the, in the margin of your Bibles, um, make yourself little note cards, whatever the case is, to have an outline to help you, to prompt you until it becomes second nature to you. A lot of this teaching now is becoming second nature to me because I'm in it all the time. That's all I want to study. That's all I want to learn. That's all I'm part of. And, and it helps me to put the rest of the book together. I don't fear opening any portion of this book anymore like I did at one time in my life. I told you, before I really got into this, when it came to the end times, I dreaded it. Now I love teaching the end times because it don't scare me anymore. And I don't, I'm not afraid that I'm going to teach something wrong because I can see what's going on. Now I'm not saying that in a braggadocious way. I'm saying it's because the Bible says study to show yourself approved. So you got to come to the place and, and study it. Just a minute. Studying is more than just opening up and reading it. Studying is taking the time to go verse by verse with a pen and piece of paper, 
writing stuff down, making notes, cross-referencing, and getting into it. And building your case for the hope that is in you. And every one of you have already come to this place. You've put your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection. So you have the capacity now to discern, to be led, and to be taught. By who? By the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. That's key. And how does the Holy Spirit teach today? Do you hear an audible voice from heaven? No. You get no. through the Word. Through the Word. And you'll be energized and have the discernment to know. Because it'll be built up in you. Folks, you know, early on, when I, when I thought it was necessary to type up notes and stuff, all the spelling errors I had, and how afraid I was afraid to uh, teach even sound doctrine. I wanted to make sure I got it right, and I was scared as all get. But now, look, you know, I double-check my work, I look it over there, every once in a while there's some typos in there. Uh, you know, it might not always be grammatically correct, but the gist of it's in there. And I've had to come to that place of assurance. And just like somebody that's going to stand up and be a defender of somebody, a lawyer or an attorney, you've got to have some knowledge within you. A lawyer just can't stand up in a courtroom and open up his mouth to defend a criminal. That guy's got to know if he's going to build a defense for a criminal. Even if all the allegations, all the defenses and, 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 and the... The um, evidence. evidence is up against him. That lawyer's got to know the statutes, got to understand how he could defend this guy and get him off the hook. Now, apply that to our lives with grace. You and I have gotten off the hook. Oh, there's a mounting evidence against us. All the creation cries out against us, groaning for the appearing of the Son of God. And, and, and so there's piled up evidence and Satan's there accusing the brethren and doing everything he can do and, 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 and we're hearing all this stuff and we're feeling defeated but our attorney stands up and he looks at the judge and he says, Judge, I know the statutes that'll take care of all of that. It's my shed blood. And the Heavenly Father has accepted that as the price to pay for all the accusations of all the sins. See how simple that was? Did I quote any verses? No. Yes, I did. No, you did. Did you hear me go Romans, whatever, and this, that, and the other? That stuff's important, and that'll come to you. But get it, I, I, I taught the Word, did I not? Yeah. You know, my defense is the cross, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And this man who sits before you judge has put his faith and trust in that. And the statue says, if he does, he's made free from the law of sin and death. And now he lives under a new law. Isn't that good? It's good. Okay. And, and that's, what, that's what we all have. And so there is absolute truth. And we have to accept it as absolute truth. We have to trust it as absolute you know, a lot of times we look at the Word and we, we look at the verses and, and we apply it to our lives and we're like, no, I don't see the outcome yet. You know, I, I don't see the results yet. You know, I'm, I'm struggling with this, Lord, and I'm struggling with that, Lord, and this, that, and the other. You come to enjoy that journey that you're walking through. Because ultimately, the reality is, we're not going to get it all. We're not going to figure it all out. We're going to continuously be learning. Even after the rapture of the church, we're going to be learning. The teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit is not going to stop just because we get raptured out of here. You, you look at what's going to be going down in the earth, and so many folks are, and this hit me, because it was one question I had, and I couldn't quite figure it out until I saw the verse. And when I saw the verse, boom, the light bulbs went on. Why in the world, if Jesus has come and has been the ultimate sacrifice for all of mankind. Why then, during the millennial reign of Christ, is there going to be sacrifices and stuff going on? Does anybody know in this room? The reason why this... Remember, what is going to be the ministry of, of the nation of Israel? 
They're going to go forth. Each of the twelve apostles is going to have dominion over a portion of the earth. And they're going to go forth and they're going to teach. Okay? If you look at each of the sacrifices and, and, and the things that were set up by God, according to the law, each of the sacrifices taught something about God. Taught something about Christ. Taught something about His grace, His love, His mercy. Um, and, and, and the foreshadow. That's all going to be going on. And it hit me like, and the verses are right there. I can't give them to you right now because they're in my studies, but they're in there. And it tells you why. And for years I wrestled with it. Why in the world do, are they going to start the sacrifices again? Well, it's going to be teaching. There is not going to be any need for a sin offering in the sense that they're applying and asking God to cover their sins. Their sins have already been covered. The, the, the blood has been sprinkled on the mercy seat by this point. Christ is sitting on the throne. He's reigning for a thousand years in his money will reign. The blood is the issue of the, the, the sin offering, but in the offering itself, there's going to be teaching. And they're going to go forth, and they're going to teach the nations of the world all about it. You know, you, you have the peace offerings, you, 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 all the different offerings that are there. They're all going to be reinstituted for teaching. Not that it's going to provide anything of atonement in the sense forgiveness of sins, you know, taking care of this, because that's all been done. But it's going to be for teaching. And it's powerful. And, and then up in, in heavenly places, the Holy Spirit's still going to be teaching us. You know, for a year, another thing, for years, we thought, well... How is anybody going to get saved after the rapture of the church because the Holy Spirit stays with the church? The verses don't say that. doesn't say that at all. We saw this early on. The Holy Spirit is going to pick up where he left off. Well, that's a right reason there. why then. Yeah. Going to pick up where he left off. Not, not the reason why the offerings are going to be reinstituted. Yeah. Because Christ has come and the teaching is going to happen. He, the, he, by this point, he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. Well, that's going to be included in the teachings. Right. And so here, but the Holy Spirit picks up where he left off. And I'm like, well, the Holy Spirit doesn't go up with us. The Holy Spirit, well, let me, let me correct that. The Holy Spirit does go with us. The Holy Spirit is God. God can't be here and here at the same time. Can't be teaching us up here and down here at the same time. He's on the prison. Yeah. Christ is going to be up here. Christ is going to be down here. It's like, well, you know, are, are we going to be able to come back and forth? You know, are we going to be up in heavenly places? Are we going to be able to come down to the earthly kingdom and see what's going on? I don't know. Verse doesn't tell us. But if we're going to be like Christ, I imagine we'll have the capacity to do that. Because the Bible says we'll be like Him. And, our, and, our, and, our, and we'll have resurrected bodies to do that. So will the folks, when Abraham comes forth and he's ruling and reigning with Christ, do you think he's going to be in his old crusty body that's been dead for all these years? No, he's going to be in a glorified, resurrected body. He was promised that. Abraham knew, the verses tell us, Abraham knew that if he sacrificed Isaac, God would have raised up Isaac to fulfill the promise. He knew that. It tells us that in Hebrews. He knew that. He already knew about resurrection from way over here. All the way there from the teachings that he received. Isn't that wonderful? That's cool. That's cool stuff. Okay, but I can go on and on. And my time is far spent. My alarm's going to go off. Our gracious and wonderful... Well, I mean, before I stop, any questions? About absolute truth, understanding that, that as ambassadors, we need to have the ability to defend or be apologetics and defend for what we believe. Any questions? No? Okay, let's pray. Our gracious and wonderful Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word once again tonight. And we thank you, Father, that we do have truth. And we have sound doctrine and sound words and that we do have the word that tells us to rightly divide so that we can see exactly what you're doing today and that how we apply the truth of your word, your completed word, cover to cover to our lives and how it's applicable, what we look after and what we apply our lives to grow and to flourish and yet the rest of it is there for our edification, it's there, there for our learning, it's there for our understanding that, that we won't do the same things that folks did in times past or what they'll still do in ages to come. But we, will have the, we have the capacity now to walk in peace, knowing that you've taken care of the price, knowing that you've taken care of all things. 
and put all things in order so that we can have that peace that passes all understanding, knowing that nothing will ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Help us to the sin, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we'll pick up uh, with the evidence necessary for belief. Woo! Just ripped out my notes. Yeah, that's what you get.